Okay. Hello, I'm Dong Hyuk, and I try to present the direct memory access unit using dual port memory. I will explain what is the dual port memory and how can I use this dual port memory to get some benefit. So it's problem. So there's a CPU and DRAM and storage. It's very simple architecture. So the problem is that the cost of the channel between CPU and DRAM is very expensive. We uh, to add more channels, we add a lot of pins inside, uh, into the CPU side. So it's difficult to increase the number of channels between CPU and DRAM. The problem is, too is that if there is a page migration from the storage to DRAM or vice versa, in that case, we cannot access, CPU cannot access the DRAM itself because the the channel is uh, well, uh, occupied by the page migration. Second thing, if there is a page copy within a DRAM, in that case, we cannot uh, access DRAM because of such a page migration operation. It consumes all, uh, the whole bandwidth. This is problem. Channel is well, worth resource and uh, uh, there is a lot of redundant operation like page migration and page copy. How can I mitigate this problem? I try to introduce dual port memory, dual port DRAM. Uh, dual port DRAM has two port and uh, the inside of the DRAM, a lot of bank is located. In this example, eight bank is exist. So dual port memory is having dual port and each port has independent command and address and data birth. So uh, both port can access DRAM independently. And the, uh, each bank can be allocated one of the ports. So uh, for example, bank one is allocated port two. In this case, uh, port one cannot access to bank one, but uh, port two can access to the bank one. Uh, port two is allocated to uh, bank two is allocated to port two, and bank three is allocated to, to the port one. And the authority to access the each bank can be changed uh, can be changed di dynamically on long time by uh, by issuing specific command. How can we use this dual port memory? Is that clear? What is the dual port memory? Okay. How can we? use this dual port memory. Uh, one mechanism is that I add the dynamic, uh, DMA is a dy dy uh, dynamic memory access unit uh, outside of the uh, CPU chips. So uh, through the DMA, uh, storage, is, uh, storage is linked to the dual port memory and CPU is also linked to the dual port memory. I, I call the one port in here as the CPU side port and this one as the uh, DMA side port. So if there is some um, request to, to migrate some storage page to the dual port memory, in that case, uh, we allocate some specific uh, bank which is required to the migration to the uh, DMA side port. And uh, through the DMA, we can migrate the whole data from the storage to the uh, dual port memory. During that time, the other bank, which is located, CP, located to the CPU port, we can also access during that time. So we can mitigate the uh, channel bandwidth consumption uh, I previously explained uh, uh, for the uh, page migration using these dual port memory architectures. Second scenario is that if there is some page copy, it can be also supported by DMA side like this. One more thing, like Apple. <laughs> okay, yeah. DMA is, uh, if there is a two CPU and GPU, the left side is located in CPU and GPU is located in here or some other uh, hardware accelerator. It's linked through the dual port memory and uh, DMA. So if there is some uh, communication from uh, between the CPU and GPU or CPU and hardware accel accelerator, we can also communicate through dual port memory and DMA like this. 
So uh, such a, uh, by introducing dual port memory and outside the DMA, uh, we can use uh, the channel, memory channel, more efficient way. Yes, the cost of the doubling the dual uh, dual port memory channel is about twenty percent area overhead. So previously, CPU had has such overhead to increase the number of channels, but I moved the overhead to the dual port memory side because the memory is more cheaper uh, cheaper than uh, CPU. So this is methodology. I Try, uh, I, try, I try to evaluate the page migration between storage to the DRAM. So I just use the uh, X86 simulators, and uh, I use SPAP benchmark and TCP and stream. And uh, uh, the important information is I use uh, uh, storage which has the flash cache uh, Flash cache latency is about 32 microseconds. It's the most, well, fa uh, the fastest uh, uh, Mac uh, device that I can use. Uh, it's uh, my result. So the basic one is that basically if I meet a new page, in that case, I just guess that one as the page fault or required to uh, page migration from the storage to DRAM. So as you can see, uh, and this is the dual core simulations. Uh, the X axis is the benchmarks and uh, Y axis is weighted speed up. As you can see, the performance improvement is very low. <laughs> about that, about the most uh, performance is about 1.2%. The reason why it shows a very low performance improvement is that uh, the great, uh, the very high access latency to the storage is about 32 microseconds. Uh, compared to the, the page migration time, the benefit which I can get, some, uh, get the, uh, from this architecture is that I use the, this page migration time more efficient way to some other things. But compared to the latency of the storage, it's very low. So future work is that uh, it takes quite a quite long time to simulate this uh, scenario. So I need some, I require some uh, method to speed up simulation time. Uh, second thing is that I can vary the number of cores uh, after uh, speed up the simulators. And I can also vary uh, the size of the, uh, the instruction window size and the number of requests which can be parallelized uh, from storage to DRAM. In that case, I think we can get more benefit. Uh, or I try to also a uh, page copy model uh, within DRAM. In this case, obviously, I can get more benefit. And the CPU GPU communication model is also a promising model, I think. Uh, that's it. Is so there any? Those results did not make sense to me. Uh, why? <laughs> because I don't understand them. I think that's. Uh, by explanation or. The why is page migration time so low? That doesn't look right. That's 0 0.96 nanoseconds. Uh, it's that's almost instantaneous migration. Uh, so, uh, in my model, I weight the latency of the storage. After that, uh, as the clock cycle of the, uh, after that, I migrate one page from the storage to the uh, DRAM using the DRAM cycle times. So it's correct. I think. Do you mean 0.96 microseconds? Yes. Not nanoseconds. Yes, microseconds. That says nanoseconds. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's upside down view. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's <laughs> microseconds. Okay, sorry. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. But still, maybe you're, maybe you're not setting up the experiment so that this yeah. becomes a bottleneck, right? Yes. So in this simulation, it takes quite a long time, about two days, for yeah. uh, getting such a result. 
So the simulation, uh, time, uh, the instruction for the simulation is of uh, uh, 10 million. It's not enough. So I have to increase the uh, number of uh, the instruction numbers to for the simulation. But it takes a long time, so I did not get the results yet. Yeah. If I get a long, more longer simulation, in that case, we can get some saturation point, and maybe the page migration is reduced. In that case, <coughs> we can get more benefits. And also, if you have more cores doing this. Yes, exactly. That's why. Intention. Yes, exactly. That's why I want to more core simulation and uh, more instruction set environment. So what you're saying here is, I think, storage latency is so high that yes. the interference caused by uh, page migration with the other memory requests is not that high. Yes, exactly. So but most of the time you're bringing the page from. Yes, exactly. Flash, yes. So most of the simulation time, the uh, CPU core is stored for the waiting for the. Uh, uh, page migrations. Mm -hmm. So that's why we show this. this uh, I think you need to set up the experiment to show that this is a problem. Yes. Right. And it could be a problem more with when the storage is closer, right? With uh, closer mean to low latency or? Yeah, low latency. Oh, yeah, in the case. Phase change memory. Yes. Some other storage. Yes. It's closer than flash. Yeah. Okay, anyway, we can talk about that. Okay. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Now we're done with all of the milestones. I need something. So I know I promised data flow, but I think it would be good to cover interconnects a little bit more. This will be the fourth lecture on interconnects. And you read a paper also, right? Which was due yesterday. So we'll talk about that also. And some more of assignments. <laughs> I figured you would read the papers and then we'd cover data flow. That would make it uh, much more interesting. So you did these two reviews. What, what did you guys think of those, by the way? Ergia, was it interesting? Yeah? What about the Dennis and Misuna's paper? Was it easy to understand? No? <laughs> some people say yes, some people say no. <laughs> that means it's a... <laughs> some of the terminology is old in that paper, but it's a seminal paper that uh, put forth the data flow paradigm uh, as a way of executing prog programs. And we'll cover more of that. That's, that's what some of your other readings are. Well, uh, I hate to break the news to you, but this will be an even harder reading. So <laughs> get ready for it. But hopefully this prepared you a little bit. And uh, I also gave you some papers. This sh these should be hopefully easier after these papers uh, that talk about uh, the restricted data flow paradigm. Basically, how can you... This is, these are the original out-of-order execution papers. How do you do micro data flow or restricted data flow underneath with a control flow uh, ISA or control-oriented ISA? Okay, and this is due Thursday. Is that good? 
<laughs> These are short papers. Papers used to be shorter in micro 1985 or so. And it became, <laughs> they became longer and longer over time because people needed more data. And as you, see, you will see that there is no, not, not much data in, actually maybe no data in one of these papers. This critical issues papers I think just talks about critical issues in basically a restricted data flow microarchitecture design. What are the things that you need to solve? And it foreshadows a lot of the problems that people have dealt with uh, over the last 30 years or so. For example, it foreshadows the memory disambiguation problem. It's called the un unknown address problem in this case, uh, in this paper. And we've dealt with that, right? In multiscalar, for example. But people have looked at it uh, a long time ago. Okay, hopefully those will be fun. And other readings, you can look at that. I haven't assigned these, but we'll talk about them when we get to them. Okay, milestone one meetings. Hopefully everybody's aware of uh, everybody else's project. That was part of the uh, purpose of the meetings, having the, uh, having the uh, talks in the class so that everyone can see them. Feel free to talk with each other to provide feedback. That's, that's how research improves, right? And please come to office hours for feedback on your progress. If you want that feedback and your presentation, I've already told some of you during the presentation or afterwards to come and see me and uh, I have feedback. And I've already talked with uh, several groups. Uh, there are a lot of interesting projects, I think. And you can, you can actually uh, turn some of these projects into good research contributions as well up here. I know some of you are planning to do that. So, so please come talk with me uh, about both progress and presentation, I think. Talk with Han also. Okay. Just to refresh your memory, we talked about transactional memory. That was two lectures ago. And we wrapped up interconnect, although interconnect, I guess, became alive again, <laughs> which is part of this lecture, or most of this lecture. Uh, and we've done the milestone one presentations. Today, we'll, we're probably going to do only this one and not be able to start data flow. But hopefully, it'll be interesting. Any questions before you jump onto interconnects? Okay, let's jump on it then. So this will be more research oriented. Some, uh, uh, in particular, some of the research that we've been looking at in interconnection networks uh, that I think is important. Uh, so I would like to expose you at least to some of the ideas and some of the directions interconnect research is taking. You've already seen uh, the aspect of interconnect research that's on efficient, very efficient interconnects. And we've already discussed that. That's, a, that's an extremely important research direction, I think. Uh, you have to make the efficiency of communication as high as possible if you want to build a scalable system, right? And this is very, very fundamental. I think I was talking with you about communication, right? Communication always adds latency and energy. This is true for humans also, right? When you need to, if you need to uh, come to school all the way from, I don't know, Monroeville, maybe that's not far for some of you, but that's much more overhead energy uh, and uh, complexity and cost on your part compared to coming to school from, I don't know, Craig Street, right? That's, it's so fundamental, you cannot avoid it. And uh, if you want to build a system that's scalable, you've got to localize things and you've you got to make the routers efficient. And if your routers are not efficient, and roads are very good examples of this, right? Uh, if you have a router at every single intersection, the likelihood of getting a red light is very high and the latency increases significantly, right? And this, this is actually my uh, pet peeve about Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, the Fifth Avenue, uh, this is circuit switching versus packet switching, right? You have the red lights. If you synchronize the red lights, you can just flow through that street, right? That's circuit switching, in a sense, you're switching the circuit in a, uh, at some level. Because once you hit the light, it's going to turn uh, green. If you don't do that, you encounter significant latencies. And people who designed that, those lights on Fifth Street were not able to think of that. <laughs> I don't know if you like, <laughs> looks like some, of, some people sympathize with that. <laughs> and maybe, maybe if you want to fix that, you can send them email or something. But <laughs> This is, again, very fundamental, right? In uh, 
in a mesh network, if you have to go through this every router, and if every router needs to route something, route the packet, it just takes so much latency. And you don't want that. You really want either a direct connection, which we will see in some of the research, uh, or somehow set up the router such that you don't need to do the routing. That, and that's the idea of circuit switching, right? You just do the routing once and then send the packet. It just gets to its destination quickly. Right? Otherwise, you'll expend energy, you'll have cost, you'll have additional latency. So a lot of the research is targeted towards, I think, uh, these things. And there are plenty of topics in interco inter interconnection networks, I think. We've already covered energy and power efficient and proportional design. You don't want to expend more power than you really need. Reducing complexity is very important because it relates to this energy uh, very much. If you have a simplified router, you can add more things on the system. Adaptivity is another uh, topic. Ability, adapt, ability to adapt to different access patterns. That's something that has not been explored as much. Uh, people have designed networks to uh, actually mm, be very good for the common case. But you can think of this as specializing the networks for particular ex access patterns, right? Especially if you have different heterogeneous components on chip Maybe you want to have multiple networks that you can switch between depending on the requirements of your components. Maybe bandwidth sensitive network versus latency sensitive network where you direct the applications. So these are some interesting research ideas and topics. Quality of service is very important. Performance isolation uh, is very important. If, there, if you have contention, if you have interference between different applications uh, and some of them are la uh, latency sensitive, you want to somehow have the guarantees, good guarantees. This problem is very similar to the problem we've examined in memory controllers or caches, right? Any shared resource, network is no different. You would like that here. Uh, and you, you may want some admission control also into the network. I think co-design uh, of network on chip with other sh shared resources is also important because this enables you end-to-end uh, -end performance. For example, you, you can have a network on chip. Eventually, it delivers some packets to the core or uh, to the memory controller, right? And if these are not coordinated with each other, they can make very contradictory decisions. If your memory controller is prioritizing thumb packets and network is prioritizing some other packets, maybe overall your system performance degrades, even though you do intelligent prioritization in each of those resources. If these resources are aware of each other or the prioritization mechanism is consistent across them, then you get much better performance as well as energy. And I won't show, that, show an example of this to you, but you can imagine cases. But I'll show an example within the network. So you would like coordinated policies even within the network. If one router is prioritizing another, an application, uh, let's say application one over application two, and if the other router is doing the exact opposite decision, then you might as well not prioritize any application right? because you're going to revert the benefits that you would get in one router uh, in the other router. So that coordination is very important across the entire system. And this is an important topic, actually. How do you coordinate your resource management decisions across all of your resources? Scalable topologies, this is also important, as we will see uh, in some of the research we'll discuss. Again, you've seen the mesh topology, right, which is very commonly uh, proposed today. And some, uh, some companies even implement the mesh topology today, like Tylera. Uh, but this is very inefficient, right? If you want to go from one end of the chip to the other end, now you just need, you need to go through many routers to get to your destination. Whereas if you had some direct links that provided access uh, to those, uh, uh, access uh, to, that provided you with the ability to skip some routers, that can give you much better latency and contention characteristics also. Fault tolerance, uh, well, I will not talk much about that, but that's important with any resource. And these are also important, request prioritization, priority inversion. These are, these are related to uh, many of these things we've discussed. And some new technologies might be interesting also. People are looking at optical interconnects uh, because of their potential uh, reduced energy compared to electrical interconnects and also potential bandwidth, uh, high, high bandwidth uh, support. Uh, it's not clear if that's uh, easy to do because we don't know how to do optical computation today, which means that you can do communication maybe optically nice. Let's assume that uh, you can manufacture these things uh, on chip. But when you need to do computation, 
Now you have to do some conversion, right? Between optical to electrical. And vice versa when you need to store the data or send the data. Then the question is, is that, is that uh, conversion efficient enough to outweigh the, uh, I guess, if the, is that conversion efficient enough such that you get an overall efficient system by having only your communication optical? So it's not clear. But you can take a look at some papers. And 3D uh, interconnects, like 3D die stacking, maybe you can actually reduce the cost of your interconnects by partitioning your routers across multiple stacks, right? That's, uh, and there are some papers related to that. You can let me know if you're interested. Any questions? I've covered a lot of topics in one slide, but just to give you a broad overview of uh, the wealth of research topics in this area. Okay, so let's focus on one aspect of it. I'll talk about packet scheduling, and then we'll also look into topologies and quality of service a little bit, combine them together. And you may have read some of these papers. Uh, the pa packet scheduling, the problem is simple, right? Which packet do you choose for a given output port? Basically, the router needs to prioritize between competing flits or packets, whatever your scheduling ground layer T is. Uh, which input port does the router prioritize? Which virtual channel does the router prioritize? Or maybe which application's packet does the router prioritize? There may be many inputs uh, to make this decision. So today, many common strategies uh, uh, focus around, well, they, they don't take into account applications, basically, in general, at least on the chip. Uh, one common strategy is very simple. You round robin across the channels, virtual channels. If a virtual channel has a packet, and if it's turn has come, then you pick that virtual channel to prioritize. Another one is age-based, oldest, pa oldest packet first. This is a little bit more complex. Now you need to do a priority comparison, right? Whereas round robin is simple. You know what to prioritize uh, earlier. Uh, so people try to approximate oldest packet. Uh, or you can prioritize some virtual channels over others, right? Especially if you want to uh, have some priority support. If an application is more important than the other one, you can direct that application to that virtual channel that's prioritized. This way you can get a little bit of the application level prioritization benefits. So maybe you can have better policies in a multi-core environment. And I'll show you that some of uh, these two policies are not necessarily high performance. Again, for very similar reasons that we've seen for memory controllers earlier. If you do all this packet first, you're implicitly prioritizing some applications that are intensive or network intensive. Maybe we can use some application characteristics to do better. So I'll talk about the application aware packet scheduling. Well, the problem is this. You have many applications, and network on chip is one of the critical resources that are shared by the applications. And how you actually prioritize these applications matters. I think you, have you seen these slides before? Did Chris use them? No? Or maybe you don't remember. <laughs> so if you look at our router, basically it consists of many virtual channels. This is just one example. And uh, those virtual channels contend for ports here, and basically the goal of the router is to connect an input virtual channel to an output virtual channel. Uh, of course, the input virtual channel should be requesting that output virtual channel. So you have the control logic that does this, that allocates uh, the switch to a particular uh, virtual channel, to a particular packet that's waiting to be scheduled. So the problem is you, you may have a contended router like this. You may have packets from different applications. And the scheduler is basically, uh, its job is to pick one of these and send it to an output port. And for each output port, it needs to do that. And you've seen the complexity of this uh, two lectures ago or three lectures ago, right? And there are many, many different ways of actually designing this. Uh, this arbit arbitration logic, we will not cover that. We'll cover more higher level policies uh, to implement in this arbiter. And the key is which packet to choose. Well, existing policies are unaware of applications, round-robin or age-based. Uh, there are two problems with this. One is, well, I guess, unaware of applications. Let's start with that one. Uh, they treat all applications packets equally. But you already know that this is not a good idea, perhaps, right? If an application has only one packet, and it'll make fast progress if that packet gets prioritized. You would like to prioritize that, right? 
because that packet doesn't hurt the other applications necessarily. And uh, another application that has many packets is slow anyway. Right? So that's one problem. The second problem is, uh, and this is more important in a network on chip context, uh, the policy uh, is local to a router, which means that if you do a round robin within a router, uh, and if you do age-based prioritization within a router, uh, one router may prioritize one application, whereas another router may deprioritize that application, and you get inconsistent prioritization. Right? Whereas you may want to have one application go through quickly from, uh, for all routers. If you have coordinated decisions across all the routers, that application's packet's prioritized, and it goes through fast. Right? And if you think of it, you could prioritize one application, and then the next application, you could rank applications, and each of them get their packets flowing smoothly across the network instead of it getting intermingled. Okay? Well, yeah, applications are heterogeneous, you know that. So the solution uh, to both of these problems is actually application-aware global scheduling policies. Well, let me tell you one motivation for this. Applications are not homogeneous, and applications have different we call this criticality here uh, with respect to the network. Some applications are network latency sensitive and some applications are more network latency tolerant. And let's call this the stall time criticality of an application. This is not the best terminology uh, I've come to believe after years, but <laughs> let's call it that way for now. This is the criticality imposed uh, by a packet. And let's, we can measure it by the average network stall time per, uh, you get per packet. It's basically the number of cycles the processor stalls waiting for the network transaction to complete. And you can average it across all network transactions. Right? And different applications have different values of this. Why? You guys know why, right? I already told you, actually. Basically, there are two reasons. One is memory level parallelism, and the other is applications have different intensities. Although, yeah, this is, this is what, what that means. Basically, if an application has uh, lower network load, its intensity is lower. Anyway, I'll skip some of these. I'll just give you the principle. Let's say you have an application with high memory level parallelism. This is what it looks like. Right? It generates many network packets at the same time. And the first one causes a stall. And let's say when the first one returns, the application makes a little bit more progress, only to wait for the next one. Right. Well, let's say this is the order in which the packet re packets return. In this case, the latency of the red one is overlapped with the stalls and the compute, the stall for the green one and the compute that happens after the green one. Right. In a sense, this network packet that was red is free from this application's perspective. It didn't need to wait or stall for that one. It did need to stall for the blue one a little bit, but most of the latency of the blue one is also overlapped with computation and stalling. Make sense? Yeah. So basically, this means that packet latency does not have a good correlation with the stall time of an application. Because a packet may have very high latency, but that latency may be overlapped because of parallelism that you have with other packets. And you knew this principle very well. This is memory level parallels. Which means that optimizing for average packet latency in your network may not be the right thing to do. Right? This is the same as in a memory controller. If you want to optimize for average latency in a memory controller, you may want to prioritize row hit requests over others. But that may, that may not be the right thing to do. Okay. Whereas with an application that has low memory level parallelism, all packets, let's assume that they're dependent on each other. In this case, the application stalls once for each of the packets. Right. In that case, it's these, each of these packets is important. Right. Or you can think of it as these packets have higher criticality than at least the blue and red packets here. Make sense? Because each of them causes the processor to stall for a long time. Network stall time is high. The other principle is uh, intensity in terms of uh, network latency. 
You could have a light application that doesn't inject a lot of packets into the network, and you could have a heavy, heavy application. The question is, which one do you prioritize? Let's, let's take a look at how these applications run alone. Light application has long compute phases followed by short network phases, if you will, where it's waiting for the network packet. Whereas heavy application has short compute phases that are interleaved with potentially long network phases waiting for the network. If you do round robin scheduling, what might happen is uh, round robin scheduling might prioritize heavy application for a while and you might get uh, a delay in the light application like this. And this is one example. You could get, if you look at the slowdown just in the network portion, it could be about 4x. Whereas the network slowdown of this will be 1.3x. So if you just do application unaware scheduling. Whereas if you prioritize a shorter job in terms of the network, and how do you determine the shorter job? You can determine it based on the intensity, right? How many network packets are you injecting per instruction? That would prioritize a slight application, right? Because it's not injecting many network packets per instruction. It has long compute phases. Then what will happen is maybe it's, uh, packets will get delayed for a short time in the network, but it won't, they won't get delayed uh, for a long time. Now the heavy applications packets uh, get delayed longer, but in the end, the network slowdown of this will be lower, and the network slowdown of this will be a little bit higher compared to the baseline round robin, but overall system throughput would increase, right? Because this application can make much faster progress. So we'd like to achieve something like this. We'd like to uh, prioritize these applications. Then the question is, how do you do that? Well, you need to be application aware again, or thread aware. Idea is to identify those applications that are network sensitive and prioritize their packets in each router and make sure the, pa uh, the routers obey the same ordering of the applications. That's important. So how do you do that? Uh, if you realize this is going to be relatively similar to parallelism or batch scheduling applied at the network level. You would like to have an ordering of the applications, rank the applications, and uh, once you rank the applications, some applications will be higher priority than the others, which means that you can cause starvation, right? So to eliminate starvation or to bound starvation, we're going to batch the packets using, use the concept of packet batching. And you guys remember that from parallelism over batch scheduling, right? If you, if you batch the packets and service the older batch, prioritize the older batch over younger batches, then you guarantee progress for the older batch. Okay, let's take a look at how you do this ranking. Basically, we would like to prioritize applications that are more critical. And the idea is to periodically rank these applications based on the stall time criticality or network sensitivity. And you can read the paper for many different heuristics, but one heuristic that's effective is how many network packets are you injecting per instruction, which is outermost private cache misses. The assumption is that uh, your outermost private cache is the entity that injects into this mini core network. Right? To, so that you can, uh, if, if you get a cache miss from your outermost uh, local cache bank, then you need to go to the memory controller or some other cache bank uh, to get the data. So this is a measure of network intensity, which means that if an application have, has low L1 misses per instruction, assuming L1 is the private cache. It has high store type criticality and we're going to rank it higher. Well, you can read that also. It's a stable metric because uh, misses per instruction, instructions doesn't necessarily change, right? It's not affected by uh, the network contention. You could, uh, you could potentially try to use injection rate into the network, but that's not a good metric because that is affected by your prioritization policy, right? That doesn't tell you the inherent intensity of the application. Okay, so how do you rank the applications? Mm. You can divide the execution time into fixed ranking intervals. And in this particular work, it's 350,000 cycles. And at the end of the interval, each core calculates its network intensity, L1 misses per instruction, sends it to a centralized node that basically 
takes all of these values and ranks the applications based on that, based on the L1 MPI. And you could put it somewhere in the mesh. And this is not on the critical path because this ranking interval can be sufficiently long than the rank computation time. Basically, the central node needs to uh, do the rank computation, right? Uh, and cores can use older rank values until new ranking is available, right? This way, uh, the central node communicates your rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five to each core. Okay? Let's take a look at the other component. So now that we have this ranking, uh, every router is going to obey this ranking, meaning that it'll prioritize a higher rank application over others. Uh, now, this could lead to starvation, of course. Uh, and you don't want this to happen uh, for a long time. So the solution to this is packet batching, as I described. You can group the network packets into fixed size batches. Uh, and packets of older batches will be prioritized over packets from younger batches. And you could do it in many ways. But one very simple way uh, that makes it easy in a network is time-based batching, right? You could say every, every n cycles, we're going to increment the batch ID. And, uh, and every node is aware of this. Right? That's simple. So now that you, you, can, you can have a batch ID and also a rank ID for an application, how do you actually do the prioritization? Basically, before injecting a packet into the network, the node tags the packets in the header with a priority field, which consists of the batch ID, in this case it's three bits, and the rank ID, in this case it's three bits. Rank can be quantized also, right? You may not want to distinguish between all applications because some applications may be very similar to each other. And in the router, there, there could be a three-tier priority structure, and this is the prioritization order. The router can prioritize packets from the oldest batch first, uh, to prevent starvation. And then the second order is highest rank first to maximize performance. And the third tiebreaker rule can be something else. Right? It could be, for example, round robin across the virtual channels. It could be the age. Assuming these two are the same, which means that the packets are in the same batch and same rank, then you need a tiebreaker. And you could do this with simple hardware support and a priority arbiter. So the scheduling is actually global, right? The routers do not, uh, even though they prioritize locally, the rank ID and batch ID are global. Rank ID for an application is constant within a long interval, and it's determined by this global central decision logic. And this is relatively possible to do in a, a network that's small, right? If you have an on-chip network, you could do this. And if your uh, ranking interval is longer, you could do this again. Whereas if your ranking interval becomes short, now you need to do this computation very often. And that may incur a lot of overhead to do the computation. But uh, once you're global, your ranking order and batching order are the same across all the routers. Right. So let's take a look at an example, simple example of what would be the benefit of this. Uh, to make life easier, I'm going to focus on a single router. You could imagine and extend this to multiple routers. Let's say these are the, the packets injected by core 1, core 2, and core 3. This is the injection cycle. Cycles go up. That's time. Uh, and these are the packet injection order. Let's assume batching interval length is three cycles. This is batch 0, batch 1, and batch 2. Uh, and ranking order at least in this case, assuming instructions are the same, uh, will be like this. Let's assume that green, green core higher, is higher ranked than the blue core is higher ranked than the red core. And let's say all of these packets magically arrive at the same router. It could happen, right? Or you could abstract the entire network as a single router. Uh, and uh, the idea is to have the scheduler prioritized based on what I described. Now, if you do round robin, between these packets and assume that these are the virtual channels where, the, where these packets end up, round robin would basically go round robin across the virtual channels. 
and we're round robining, as you can see. This is the time order in which packets are serviced. And this, will, this is the stall cycles with some assumption of, assumptions, of course. If you look at the green core, its packet is serviced after eight time units. For the blue core, its, after, its last packet is serviced after six time units. And for the red core, its last packet is serviced after 11 time units. And if you average this, your average stall time is 8.3. Now let's take a look at the age-based order. In this case, the scheduler picks the older packet first, which means that it starts with this one. And then it goes to two and so on. And this is the stall cycles you get in this case. Right, your, your, your average stall time has reduced, I guess by luck in this case, because it may, it may not be reduced also. This green packet may have been the oldest packet, in which case the stall time of the green application would have been 10 right, or 11, I guess. Yeah. If you do the stall time criticality-based order, Basically, what we have done is we had ranked the green application over the other one. And I don't remember the batch IDs, but if you go back here, oh, this is where I need the skip button. <laughs> if you remember, these are all from the same batch, conveniently constructed <laughs> example. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Basically, the router takes the application that's highest ranked. Uh, the packet uh, the, from the highest ranked application, and then the second highest ranked application, and then the third highest ranked application. In this case, your stall time, average stall time is five time units instead of seven or 8.3. Because you've sent the packets of the same application back to back in a manner that takes into account latency sensitivity or network intensity. So that's the idea, it's simple. And if you think about it, PARBS does a very similar thing, right? Parallelism over batch scheduling. Except here, we're coordinating across many routers. OK. I think I'll skip a lot of these. You, I've already discussed this. But there, there, there has been other work in this area, and I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, you can look at that. So how does this perform? Uh, as expected, it performs better than round robin and age-based policies and some other prior work. Uh, that tries to provide quality of service, but does so at the expense of throughput. Mm. And this is the fairness, uh, or an unfairness on the y-axis. This also improves fairness. And you can see uh, the case studies in the paper also. Any questions? Yes? The IDs are attached to each packet. IDs are attached to each packet, that's right. Mm -hmm. And when they're injected into the network, because the core is aware of the rank, and core, is, core can determine the batch based on the time, current time stamp. Yes? Uh, so we, uh, we don't know. That's right. In this case, it doesn't matter. In this case, the router doesn't care. But we'll, we'll talk about that in the next <laughs> work. That's right, yes. In this case, the algorithms are not taken. But you can improve the algorithms. That's, that's a very good point, though. Because some packets may be going to the memory controller, and they may be more important, right? And I, we will see that in the next work, in the paper you guys have read for today. Any, any other questions? So one, um, obviously, this mechanism is designed to optimize for throughput, right? But it's not really optimized for quality of service. So that's another thing to uh, think about, like predictable performance. You don't have that in this mechanism. The goal of this me mechanism is really throughput and some notion of fairness. OK, so this is the paper you've read. Maybe you guys can present it. <laughs> Who wants to do it? <laughs> no one. <laughs> Maybe I should pick the sleeping ones. <laughs> It is actually dark. It makes even me sleepy. <laughs> is there? You can try some different settings. Uh, oh. Take notes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> maybe that's what we were missing. Wow. OK, maybe this was it. <laughs> I guess we cannot blame the hurricane or the storm for everything in the world. <laughs> OK. Now I can see. 
Okay, this is the idea of slack-driven packet scheduling, and that, that will probably address some of the things that you discussed, and we've covered this already. All packets are not the same. Packets actually have different criticality. Not only applications. Applications have different intensity, and they're affected by the latency differently, network latency differently, because they have different intensity. But packets themselves uh, have different criticality, different importance for the application also, because of the reasons Samira uh, pointed out. And I think I've shown you already this. Well, I guess the point here is a little bit different. So if you look at this, different packets have different criticality. This green packet is more important, right, because it causes the stall. Uh, this blue packet is less important than the green packet, but it's more important than the red packet because it does cause a little bit stall for this application. Whereas the red packet is not as important, right, in the network because it really doesn't stall the application. So maybe you can design a policy that prioritizes this green packet over the blue packet, over the red packet, and you can get better performance. That's the idea here. What is Ergia? Well, apparently Ergia is this. <laughs> it's not actually a cat, but it's the spirit of laziness in Greek mythology. And that's where the... Uh, uh, name came from. Basically, some packets can afford to slack off. Or you can afford to slack off when prioritizing some packets. You can think of it in different ways. And that's what we're going to do uh, with this. What is the slack of a packet? It's the number of cycles in which the packet can be delayed without significantly reducing the application's performance. I added the significantly here. Ideally, without, without reducing the application's performance, but that may not be always true. Uh, and what is the source of slack? Again, memory level parallelism, as you've seen. Right? If the latency of a packet is hidden due to another packet, another potentially long latency packet, that packet can afford to slack off. And the idea is simple. Detect this and prioritize the packets with lower slack. And this principle is, again, very fundamental. Uh, you would like to, this is a very fundamental resource management principle. If you come up with ways of doing this in different resources, I'd encourage you to think about it in different, uh, uh, because this will improve your system performance, and this is a way of actually doing so without significantly hurting much else. And conversely, what you can do is, uh, maybe you cannot prioritize those packets that have high slack, but maybe uh, that have low slack, but maybe you can slow down other packets to save energy. Right? If a packet has high slack, why do you need to run the network for those packets in a, in a very fast way? Why not slow, it, slow things down? Okay, so what is the concept of slack, at least uh, from the point of view of the on-chip network? I think this is animating automatically. Let's say you have a load miss that causes this packet in this uh, core, and it's going all the way to this shared cache, and you have another load miss that causes this packet, and it just needs to go to this node that's very close by. Obviously, the latency of the second packet will be hidden. Well, it goes to this node, gets the, let's say it hits in the cache, and it brings the data back into the uh, or, uh, requesting core. Even though this may hit in the cache, it just takes a long time to bring the data back, so the over, um, the latency, see it's animating by itself, interesting. Okay, the latency of the screen packet is much longer and the latency of the blue packet is overlapped. Right. And you can think of the slack of this blue packet, if you make some assumptions and idealize things a little bit, as 20 hops, right? It takes 26 hops to service this green one, six hops to service this blue one, and Maybe you can delay this blue packet for 20 hop latencies without reducing performance. Now that's not true, right? Because uh, this blue packet may have some dependence and you enable them by servicing that blue packet. But we're gonna uh, ignore that effect right now. So that's the slack you have. So, okay, well, yeah, I can never get this to work. This is the incompatibility between Mac and Windows versions of PowerPoint. 
importance of backward compatibility. Okay, now I can, I have at least the entire slide here. <laughs> now if you have three applications, uh, this is the same one I showed you before, core A, and core B is running another application, uh, and its orange packet goes here, and its pink packet goes here. Now this pink packet has a lot of slack, right, from this application, because orange packet takes a long time. And this, blue, uh, this green packet from core A doesn't have any slack. But these two packets contend. Two packets are from different applications. One has a lot of slack and the other one has no slack. It's also shown here. Uh, the blue packet has, well, let's ignore the blue packet. The green packet has zero slack. The pink packet has six hop slack. If your router is not aware of this, it may prioritize this pink packet, right? And as a result, you're basically wasting some opportunity to improve performance. If your router was aware of this, it would prioritize this green packet. And certainly with a round robin or age-based policy, or even an application-aware policy, as I discussed earlier, you may be prioritizing this pink packet. So we, that's what we would like to not do. We would like to prioritize a packet that has lower slack which is the green one. And you could, uh, if, you, if you have that slack associated with each packet, the router can make that decision, right? Basically simply compare the slack of these different packets. The question is how do you do that? And we'll get to that. And there may be much better mechanisms, by the way. This paper introduces the concept and also provides one mechanism, which I do not believe the best is the best mechanism. It's a simple mechanism, but I'm sure there are much better mechanisms. So, well, first of all, is there a potential to do this? Uh, this uh, we did a study of the slack in applications. This is a slack of uh, slack in cycles for each packet. And the y-axis shows a percentage of all packets. And this is one application, GEMS. And you can see that approximately 9% of the packets have zero slack. And this is a cumulative distribution, I guess. Yeah, 50% uh, of packets have approximately 350 cycle, cycles of slack. Right. Because they hid in the cache, and there's another packet that was generated before, older, that goes to memory and waits for hundreds of cycles. Right. And if you look at, well, no worries. Which means that these packets are probably not that critical whereas these packets are very critical. Right? And if you look at all of these applications, you have uh, varying things. So some, some applications are different. So in some applications, in this case ART, uh, most of the packets have zero slack cycles. Basically all, all of the packets, uh, or most of the packets are very critical. But still there is a distribution. There are some packets uh, that have lots of slack cycles in ART. So you could prioritize these over others. And different applications show different uh, diversities. So the key takeaway is Slack varies between packets of different applications. Slack also varies between packets of a single application. So how do you take advantage of this? If you want to take advantage of this, you need to somehow estimate the Slack. And that's the difficult part. Right? How do you estimate the Slack? Looks like this has a mind of its own. <laughs> Or maybe it's the computer itself. <laughs> so how can you define slack? Well, this could be defined as the maximum latency among a packet's predecessors. Predecessors mean older packets, uh, or packets from older instructions, minus the latency of this particular packet that you're injecting into the network. Uh, the problem is you do not know any of these latencies, right? when you're injecting a packet. Well, you may know some of them, uh, but not perfectly. You don't know the latency of P. Why do you not know the latency of P? Because uh, uh, you may be a cache hit or a cache miss in the bank you're going to. Even if you're going to memory, even if you, you know that you're going to memory, you may actually uh, take longer or shorter depending on uh, the bank conflict conditions. But at least the first order, you should know whether you're going to memory or not, right? Okay. So we'd like to predict the latency of any packet Q. And 
a packet has higher latency if Q is an L2 miss, and if it has higher latency if it has to travel farther, a farther number of hops. So what we came up with is something like this. Basically, we, we tr do not try to estimate the exact slack of a packet. It turns out that's a difficult problem. If you come up with, that, with a solution to that problem, maybe uh, that would be very interesting. But we try to assign a slack priority to each packet. And the idea is you have these levels, different levels. And a packet uh, has a high slack priority depending on how these levels are determined. The first level is whether or not this packet is predicted to be an L2 miss. Oh, no, that's, that's the my L2, sorry. This is the predecessor L2. Basically, if any of the previous packets are servicing an L2 miss, uh, then this, these bits are set. And these bits can be set depending on the number of previous packets that are servicing an L2 miss. And the second priority level, which means that, let's say these bits are set, that means that the slack for this packet is relatively high. Why? Because the previous packets are going to memory. And even if this packet is going to memory, its latency is going to be overlapped. And if this packet is not going to memory, then it definitely has high slack, right? That's why this is uh, the high, these are the high bits. My L2 refers to uh, whether or not, well, this, this bit is set if, this packet is, an L, uh, is not an L2 miss. Right? Because you want higher slack if this packet has shorter latency. Right? So you somehow need to uh, set this bit if this packet is shorter latency. When is this packet shorter latency? If it's not a cache miss or L2 miss. And the last one is a hop est estimate, which you read about, right? This is to distinguish between uh, packets based on the hop numbers. Assume that these are all zeros, packets are all equal here, then you would like to again prioritize the packet that travels uh, farther. Right. That's the idea here. And this is the, this is a way of encoding that. This is the maximum number of hops in the predecessor packets that are being serviced minus the number of hops that you have in this packet. And you know this number, right? When you inject the packet, you know where, uh, which shared cache slides the packet will go to. But you do not necessarily know these two, which is whether or not the previous packets are L2 misses or whether or not this packet will be an L2 miss. So how do you predict that? Uh, basically, when you inject a packet, you need to predict whether or not it's going to be an L2 hit or miss. And that's, you have that decision only at the destination uh, shared cache slice. Okay, this is kind of annoying now. <laughs> used to be funny earlier, but. <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, people have actually looked at this problem, predicting whether or not something will be an L2 miss, uh, and peop, uh, or even an L1 miss. Uh, we've discussed this before, right? If you know this information, you can do better load-related instruction scheduling. Is it still going on? <laughs> okay, you can ignore that. <laughs> you can do better load-related instruction scheduling because if you know that something, if you can predict that something is going to be a L1 hit, you can schedule its dependence quickly. Whereas if you predict that something is going to be an L1 miss, then you don't schedule its dependence right away. So we use a similar predictor, basically. You can use a pattern history table and two-bit saturating counters to figure out whether or not this load is going to miss or hit. And it turns out this has reasonable accuracy. You can read the paper. Well, you should have already read the paper. I think it has about 70 to 80 percent accuracy rate. Uh, there's another uh, predictor, uh, which is more burstiness-based predictor. And the idea here is if you've gotten a lot of L2 misses recently, it's likely that you're going to get some L2 misses also, and you could also partition this based on program counter. But if you have, uh, if the number of L2 misses in the last M misses is greater than some threshold, then the next load is predicted to be an L2 miss also. Okay. And you need to do this prediction for the packet you're injecting. And you need to keep track of the predictions that you made for the predecessor packets, right? Predecessor packets are all those packets that you injected before this packet and that have not been done yet. 
Uh, and these are the list of outstanding L2 misses. And you can estimate the hops also. I'll skip this one. But there is a difficulty here, right? You don't know the latencies. And that's, that's what makes slack estimation harder. Of course, you would like to keep this up to date. So when you know the latency, you would like that information to be propagated so that you can correct your decisions. Right? Since you read the paper, you remember this. You can, uh, once, once the destination cache determines if a packet is an L2 miss or an L2 hit, it can send information back saying, oh, this was an L2 miss, L2 hit. Now you can uh, correct your predictions while other misses are outstanding. And use that information, that up-to-date information, uh, to calculate slack uh, afterwards. Again, we would like to avoid starvation, and the solution is similar to before, right? Okay. So I think I'll skip most of this, but somehow this is now becoming out of order. Uh, so what is the prioritization policy? Basically, this priority is inserted with the packet when, when the packet is injected, just like the previous mechanism, except the priority is different right now. And also a batch ID is inserted with the packet. Basically, ba batches to avoid starvation again. Okay, I'll, I'll skip these relatively quickly since you read the paper. And the more interesting th thing is really the idea. And you can guess what the evaluation would turn out right, like, right? And it does improve performance, and there are a bunch of comparison points. And you know the downsides of round robin and age based policies. And you'll read about the globally synchronized frames. I'll skip that. And uh, I've already talked to you about the application aware scheduling policies. And this is the system performance. Okay. <laughs> when you wait, it doesn't go. <laughs> so if you look at this, uh, Slack-based prioritization improves performance over application unaware policies. Also, um, SJF is the application aware policy that, that I described earlier. This is the stall time criticality policy. It does improve performance a little bit, but you get better performance if you actually use Slack as well as application awareness in your scheduling decisions. And this paper does it in a particular way, but I don't think the problem is really solved yet, meaning you can have much better ways to do, uh, to combine Slack-based prioritization as well as uh, application awareness information. And unfairness also improves because now you're actually, uh, if your prediction accuracy is good, if you're predicting the Slack well, uh, you're not unfairly delaying something. You're really improving performance at no cost, right? At no cost to anything else assuming your prediction accuracy is perfect. It's not perfect, but uh, empirically, uh, unfairness is uh, better because that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Okay, I think I'll skip to the next one since we're uh, going fast. But any questions on this? Yes? So do we uh, distinguish between the prefetch based business and the actual business? So that's a good question. In this, in this work, we did not take into account prefetches. Well, you could, you could imagine uh, predicting the slack of the prefetches also. You could, you could say that prefetches do not uh, have a lot of slack. And you could inject them that way. But that's not necessarily true also. That's one way of extending this work, actually. Actually, we are uh, taking into account the previous misses, right? So maybe the previous miss might be a, just a prefetch and we can't be later depending on that. That's right, exactly. So you need to distinguish between prefetches and demands in that case. And there may be other sources like maybe in run ahead or some. some other that's right, exactly. Run ahead is an implicit prefetch, but maybe it's a more accurate prefetch than others. But that's exactly uh, uh, what I said. The idea is there conceptually, but that uh, looking at that direction, for example, is an, an important research direction. How do you do the prioritization? in the presence of these different types of requests. Could be prefetch, it could be run ahead, could be some other request, control requests, right? You'll have coherence requests also uh, injected into the uh, network. How do you do that prioritization? It's quite interesting. 
Maybe you can come up with solutions for that. <laughs> yeah. At least the shared cache. Is it like locate some other at some other node? There, since you mentioned. So yeah, L two is distributed across the nodes. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Should we take a break or just keep going? I'll skip to the topology one. I guess I keep going. Is that what I hear? Or what I see? <laughs> I'll keep going. I'll try to end early. <laughs> okay. Another important uh, factor in scaling. So this was more on uh, quality of service and application awareness. We did not talk about strict quality of service, which is a very important problem also uh, as you scale the system. But another important factor is what should your topology be like? Right. Uh, we've looked at many different topologies, but we didn't examine uh, any of them in significant detail. So I wanted to give you a flavor of that. Uh, and the idea here is to design a topology that's better than a two-dimensional mesh. Even though this looks good, it's nice to lay out, it's, it's a horrible topology, right? Why? Well, I guess positives, I already uh, told you about that. Although this is also debatable, right? Simple fast routers comparatively to what I'll show next. It's not simple fast routers compared to uh, much more efficient routers that you've seen in, uh, in Chris's lecture. So the big pro of a two-dimensional mesh is it's, it has low design and layout complexity, right? You can literally uh, take a node and stamp it. Uh, the cons is it has a very large diameter, right? If you want to, and you already know the terminology diameter, how long it takes to get from uh, one node to the f uh, one end of the network to the farthest end of the network. To get from here to here, you have lots of hops. Right? Which means that you need to go through each router which adds energy and latency. This is the problem I was talking to you about. You have to stop at each traffic light. You have to arbitrate. And if you have contention, that's even worse. So one way of uh, improving this is to concentrate the nodes. Make the network a little bit more hierarchical. And this is, uh, again, a fundamental concept. Uh, concentration. Multiple terminals are attached to a single router node. So instead of having a router in each node, in each processor, let's say, have, router, have a router that's shared by four processors in this example. And connect these processors maybe with a bus. Now this is a hierarchical network. You have locally a bus, globally a mesh. Uh, or a crossbar. In this case, it says crossbar, but it doesn't have to be a crossbar, right? You can have fast near neighbor communication. Uh, and now you have a hop count reduction, right? Because getting from here to here doesn't cost you, I guess, however many hops here, it costs you much less, I guess 4x less. Uh, and this is one way of scaling the network up. Right? The downside is uh, you would like to really concentrate more, right? To amortize the cost of the routers, meaning put more nodes within these uh, pockets of nodes, if you will. Uh, but you cannot do that because now your complexity increases. You have the same scalability problem within that little pocket. Right? If you have a bus, you cannot, you cannot put more than n nodes here. If you have a crossbar, again, you have complexity. You could go one more hierarchy level, but then that adds complexity also. So basically, the benefit is really limited by the complexity you can have in this little node. So you cannot concentrate uh, arbitrarily. So you your scalability is still limited. And also, I guess one, one side effect of concentrating is uh, you have fewer channels and greater channel width. Right? If you look at this picture, uh, we had one, two, I guess one and two here, two outgoing paths. Now those are concentrated together also, assuming you keep the number of links or width of links the same. Right? Now this may or may not be good, right? You have a bigger channel width, you can send something more, but uh, now you have fewer channels. You cannot send 
uh, two things at the same time. So one way, one way of do, uh, fixing this problem is to replicate the routers. Instead of having a single router, have two routers here. And that's the idea. Now this restores a channel count. If you compare this to this, this is wider channels, fewer channels. This is more channels, but uh, narrower channels. This restores the channel count and restores the channel width, and it reduces your crossbar complexity also. Okay, and let's call this the concentrated mesh times two because you replicated uh, the smaller channels. You've seen the butterfly network? How many, how many of you remember butterflies? Not the, not the <laughs> bug butterflies, the butterfly network. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the on-chip version of it, flattened butterfly. So people have proposed ways to improve the connectivity. Uh, if you look at this, this, a similar problem exists, right? You still need to, from going from here to here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six hops. So how do we improve connectivity? By exploiting the wire budget. Uh, the idea is to have flattened butterfly. And flattened butterfly, what it looks like is basically uh, from each concentrated node, you have connections to every other in each row. That's it, basically. Now, also in the Y direction as well. Now, what this gives you is very fast connections, right? If you want to go from here to here, you first take this long link, or express channel, if you will, uh, to here, and then take the express channel from here to here basically two hops. And you're limited only by the wiring latency. There is no router. There's only one router that you need to go through, which is this. And this is what it looks like. It looks a little bit more complicated. It's not as regular and beautiful anymore, right? <laughs> but you support all uh, connections uh, within uh, one row and within one column. That's the idea of flat and butterfly. The pro is it has excellent connectivity, right? And its diameter is also low. It's two hops going from uh, any node to any other node. Now the downside is you have high channel count. Right? If you count the channels, uh, and I'll let you do the math, it's k square over two per row or column. Well, which means that your channel width goes down also, right? Assuming you have the same bisection bandwidth. Uh, and somehow you need to arbitrate, right? Control complexity increases. And I'll let you think about this. Uh, this requires some thinking. And you can read the paper also. It's a micro 2007 paper. So we don't want the cons of this. Somehow can we get the benefits of flat and butterfly, the latency benefits, without having the cons? And that's the uh, idea that I'll describe, which is multi-drop express channels. So why not? Uh, the idea here is with flat and butterfly, as you can see, you have this nice connectivity. Every concentrated node within a same row is connected to every other one. And that, get, that enables you fast access. So, but, but you can get that in a different way. And that's, uh, the, uh, that's the idea of multi-drop express channels. Basically, you have a single wire bus connecting all, but you have multiple drops on this bus. And these drops are not full routers. That's the idea. The drop is essentially a mux. Right? When you get to your destination, you either mux out, of the net, mux out of the bus or you keep going. Make sense? So your latency degrades a little bit, but hopefully not that much because you don't need to arbitrate. Well, you could consider this muxing arbitration also, but you don't need to arbitrate between multiple packets. That's the idea. No multi-drop express channels. And it looks a little bit nicer than flattened butterfly, I think, but <laughs> that's debatable since nothing looks as nice as mesh. Okay. If you look at the router in this note, uh, that's what it looks like. And you can study it in the paper. So the pros, now you have a one-to-many topology. And you still preserve the low diameter. 
and the channel count is reduced compared to uh, this flattened butterfly. If you look at this, the channel count is higher. Whereas here, you still have the K channels uh, per row or per column. Make sense? It's asymmetric, and the control complexity is still high, right? Or I think it's still simpler than uh, a flattened butterfly. Any questions? Is this, are the concepts clear? At least the high level concepts. I don't expect you to design the router for any of these right now. <laughs> but the high level concepts, you want fast connectivity, which this provides you uh, at reasonable channel count. Because one uh, problem with ha having very small channels is the channel utilization would be low, right? If you want to, so, okay, let me get back because that's also fundamental. Once you reduce the, uh, once you have many channels, now what's happening is if, you, if you're communicating between this node and this node, you have a narrow channel and you have to send over multiple cycles a cache line, for example. Whereas if your channel was wider, you could send the cache line right away. Right. Because you've divided the bandwidth across multiple channels here, you cannot send that cache line in one cycle. So your throughput or utilization goes down because sending from this node to this node, you cannot use the bandwidth that's available in the other channels. Right. You can just use this direct connection, that's it. With multi-drop express channels, you can use the entire bandwidth of the channel regardless of whether or not you're going from this node to this node or this node to this node or this node to this node. Right. Now your channel utilization goes up. You can more efficiently utilize your bandwidth. So you lose on latency a little bit because you need to have this multi-drop small muxing, but you gain a lot on throughput because you don't partition your bandwidth across the channels. Make sense? Yes? What is the bandwidth uh, comparable to a bus-like topology? Like it will be, uh, for, for the previous case, I could run the, the smaller interconnection at a larger, longer. Bandwidth. Higher frequency? Yes. Yeah, you could, but then that increases the complexity significantly. Okay. That's right. And the hope is that, uh, yes, that's right. This is, exa is exactly a bus, right? It's a multi-drop bus. Except it's, it goes one way. Uh, yeah. But if you want to run uh, at different frequencies, different channels, now you have, an arp, uh, you have a complexity problem. Okay. Okay. So you could actually generalize this. These are actually uh, part of a continuum, if you will. If you think of MEX, it looks like this, right? You could think of a partition mix. Now you're partitioning uh, this channel into two, and you have two buses going that way. I'll get you to the flattened butterfly. Flattened butterfly uh, basically moves these partitions in different ways, right? They're, they're not connected, but uh, they're more point to point. And there could be, well, I guess this is mix times two. You could think of partition mix which is somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, you don't have connectivity of this bus to all of the nodes, but only some of the nodes. Now you're adding more asymmetry. So now you see that this is a continuum of topologies, right? That have express channels. And the paper uh, evaluates all of these different topologies. And it's, it's very interesting, actually. The paper, you cannot fit all of this information in a single paper. Uh, but uh, some interesting things here. The diameter of a concentrated mesh is very high, whereas flattened butterfly and MEX are similar. A channel count of flattened butterfly is very high. MEX is lower, concentrated mesh is lowest. This is a channel width, and that's the downside of flattened butterfly. Uh, and these will be reflected in the results, right? Saturation throughput is determined by this channel bit width most of the time. And concentrated mesh will have very high saturation throughput compared to this. But your latency, zero load latency in the network is determined by your diameter, right? 
how fast you can communicate between the two nodes. And you will see that MEX has uh, the lowest zero load latency in the results. And these are the router inputs and outputs. This is where mesh is uh, less complex because it has four inputs and four outputs, excluding the local nodes. But if you do the calculation, if you think about it a little bit, these are the router inputs for flat and butterfly. And this is the network size. For a network size of 64, you have six inputs. For a network size of 256, you have 14 inputs. But with MEX, the outputs are only four. With flat and butterfly, it's really 14, uh, 14 because you have full connectivity. OK, I guess I'll skip these. I guess I've already done this. <laughs> OK. So the paper has some evaluation. And if you look at this, uh, this is with uniform random traffic, which I described in the earlier lecture. And this is the injection rate on the x-axis of each node. And y-axis is the latency observed. Uh, I guess let's take an example. This, this is the network that has the lowest zero load latency, which turns out to be max. And that's expected, right? Because your diameter is low. And you, you, you're utilizing your bandwidth efficiently also. Uh, and it has the lowest latency for a long uh, injection rate range. But after some point, it saturates because its channel width is not very high. Right? Whereas concentrated mesh doesn't saturate for a long time. Right? These are the mesh topologies. Their saturation throughput is higher. But if you look at their load latency, uh, their latency is very, very high, especially for mesh itself, right? Because its diameter is very high. Make sense? And you can, and flatten butterfly, it, it ends up being here. It saturates very quickly. Why does it saturate very quickly? Well, because its channels are very narrow, right? You cannot utilize them well, especially with uniform random traffic. And this could be worse with, uh, some other traffic, like hotspot traffic, because you're, you're really sending traffic down a narrow path if you have hotspots. And if your channels are very small, then your latency increases to that hotspot. OK. And the paper has some other analysis, if you look at it. And this is for 256 nodes. I guess MEX becomes more advantageous as you go uh, to 256 nodes. The so latency is low uh, for a long range. Uh, the throughput is not bad, but of course, mesh's throughput is much higher still. Uh, and flattened but butterfly saturates quickly, again, because of that, because of low channel utilization. And you can read the energy results, I guess, in the paper. I guess is there? Uh, yeah, the energy, basically, uh, the energy of mesh is usually higher it's because you have to go through all of these routers, right? Lots of hops. Uh, whereas with flying butterfly and MEX, energy is lower because you have a low diameter again. You have only one router to go through. And you can see the effects of this. That's why the router energy is very high in the mesh, whereas it's relatively low in the uh, flattened butterfly and MEX topologies. You have fewer routers to go through. And these are some real application results with network energy and latency. And these are very similar to uh, the other patterns that I showed you. Make sense? So this is one example of a scalable topology, if you will. And this is, this is another very important topic uh, going forward. You need topologies that have this low diameter and high bandwidth at the same time. And MEX is one step uh, toward that direction. Well, this is from the paper. So you can read the paper. I did not assign this paper, but uh, I like it a lot <laughs> for reasons you might imagine. Here, it's written here. I like that generalization especially of uh, the topologies and that analysis. OK. So let me tell you one more thing that takes advantage of this MEX topology to actually do better quality of service. So uh, ideally, you would like, well, I'll skip this one. Basically, we want a network that scales to thousands of nodes, right? What do you need for that? 
I've already told you some things. Good performance, what does that mean? Low diameter, low latency, high bandwidth. And you want high efficiency, obviously. Low area footprint, low energy footprint. And one other thing you want is strong service guarantees. That's quality of service, again. So you would like all of these together. And this was our attempt at putting all of these things together uh, in some way. And the idea is, uh, at least one idea, I will describe one other idea I'll skip. Uh, quality of service support in each router is expensive, even if you reduce the number of routers. Uh, because you need to have buffering, you need to have arbitration, and you need to have bookkeeping to provide quality of service guarantees, right? And one way of doing bookkeeping is to figure out how much bandwidth you've allocated to each flow in the network and try to uh, satisfy uh, the guarantees you uh, promise to each flow, maybe balance, for example. And this is one, uh, I guess, one paper that shows that it's expensive. But this paper itself is expensive also, even though we called it efficient and cost-effective. It was more efficient than cost-effective compared to previous work. So our goal was to provide quality of service guarantees at low area and power cost. And the idea is simple here. Uh, the idea is if, if you want, uh, we don't want quality of service in all of the routers in the network because that adds up significantly. So to, we, to eliminate this, uh, we can isolate the shared resource in a region of the network. Let's say you have memory controllers, they're just isolated. Shared caches, they're just isolated in a part of the network. And support quality of service in that region. So if you need to communicate within that region somehow to reach, for example, the cache bank that you're trying to reach or to reach the memory controller, you're trying to reach the, within that region, you have quality of service in those routers. But access to that region should be interference free, meaning different applications that have quality of service requirements should not interfere before accessing that region. And how do you do that? Well, if you design the topology so that tech applications can access the region without, without interference, then you can guarantee that. That's why it's called topology aware quality of service. Let me show you pictorially the idea. I'll just give you ideas, I think. Uh, let's assume that this is one use scenario. You have multiple virtual machines sharing a die, and this is one virtual machine. I don't know if, if I can see the boundaries, but this is the second virtual machine. This is the third virtual machine, somehow they're allocated this way. And this is the first virtual machine also gets these cores for some reason. Uh, let's assume that shared resources are like this, memory controllers, and the private resources are these. Now you need quality of service in all of these routers because any virtual machine can be mapped anywhere and these virtual machines somehow need to access these shared resources, right? To access memory, for example. And if you want quality of service, some kind of slowdown guarantees to these virtual machines, then uh, you need to uh, basically support quality of service in every router. But that's expensive, right? Oh, I guess I could have done that. Huh? So contention can happen when you're doing access to shared resources, right? This virtual machine can be accessing it. At the same time, this virtual machine can be accessing it. So you need quality of service. Also, uh, you, you, we need to support intra-virtual machine traffic for shared caches, and also inter-virtual machines traffic, especially when you uh, have page sharing. So you can do this if you have quality of service support in all of the routers, but we want to achieve this without that. So how do you do that? And we're gonna leverage MEX. Basically leverage this rich network con connectivity to naturally reduce interference among flows. Uh, and also limiting the extent of hardware quality of service support. And this is the idea. If your shared resources were nicely put together this way, instead of being distributed across your entire network, uh, you can have quality of service only within these nodes, and the rest of DAI can be quality of service free. So how do you do that? Well, to be able to... Uh, uh, to have this quality of service free, somehow you need to guarantee interference free access from this virtual machine to this shared resource island. And how, do you, how can you do that? Basically, you can have a richly connected topology. Right? You can use MEX to do this. 
This way, uh, this virtual machine can access the shared resource island with its own dedicated channel. And this virtual machine can access the same island with its own dedicated channel. That way you can isolate the traffic. Now what happens if you need to communicate between this virtual machine's uh, cores to the other cores of the same virtual machine? Well, you don't want to do this, right? Because you don't have quality of service in these routers. Now you'll be interfering uh, with the traffic that's coming from this virtual machine too. And that shows the interference. So if you don't want to do that, then you need to somehow route around and access the shared region first, get quality of service there, and access, uh, go, uh, go to the destination from that shared region. Does that make sense? This only happens if you haven't, if you, if you have your virtual machine cores, cores belong to the same virtual machine mapped to different or non-contiguous physical locations. Right? If these were contiguous, then you didn't need to, you wouldn't need to worry about this. This adds some latency, but if this communication is not uh, often enough, then that, that latency may not be high. Okay, so the end result is basically you, you can have quality of service free uh, or you can have most of your network quality of service free uh, which will hopefully improve your energy efficiency. And you can read the results basically. The paper has other uh, evaluations also because once you do this, actually your buffering requirements increase. So there are optimizations to reduce the buffer requirements and the quality of service free regions because if you have many links, then you have more buffering requirements. So how do you reduce that buffering requirements? One idea is to actually incorporate the buffering. Well, one idea is actually using bufferless routing. We didn't examine that, but that's an idea. The other idea is to incorporate the buffering into the links. Because you already have latches in your links, right? You may not need to have as many uh, virtual channels if you can utilize those latches for your buffering. Okay. But the end result is basically uh, you get significant area reduction. This is just with the topology of aware quality of service without buff reducing the buffering requirements. Uh, and if you reduce the buffering requirements, then you get even more area reduction. And energy also uh, reduces. Okay. I guess to summarize, uh, the idea is simple again. It's a heterogeneous network architecture. It's not homogeneous anymore. Uh, if you design, co-design the topology and the quality of service together, you can achieve a much better system that has higher area efficiency and higher energy efficiency. And that can provide all of these, including strong guarantees in terms of uh, quality of service. I guess we don't want to move to data flow, but any questions? Yes. Say it again. All the channels have same width in this case. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you could make them heterogeneous also, but that does increase your complexity again, routing complexity. But yes, depending on, depending on what kind of traffic they're serving, you may want to do that also. And that's an interesting direction as well. You can specialize more. Right now you can think of this as a specialization, right? You have a specialized portion of the network that's dedicated for quality of service. And topology is kind of specialized to uh, guarantee quality of service. And you could speci specialize even more depending on uh, what channels uh, are uh, uh, what kind of communication a channel supports. Hopefully this gave you a good idea of some of the interesting research opportunities. It's, it's really the efficiency and the quality of service put together leads to bigger opportunities, I think, uh, in this area today. Traditionally, interconnects, and you have read the CM5, the paper you don't like, for example. <laughs> I'll always remember that now. <laughs> the CM5 network. Traditionally, these networks, the large interconnects, have been designed for maximum performance, right? High bandwidth low latency and that's been uh, people have looked at that for a long time but today the focus is really higher efficiency reduced area 
And at the same time, how do we get low latency and high bandwidth? We still want to have low latency and high bandwidth, but now we have the sharing of resources, which is a, a new and big problem in multi-core architectures. That wasn't as big of a problem in the large-scale multi-computer uh, multi interconnects. So there's a lot more uh, opportunity going towards this direction. Okay, if there are no other questions, then we can save data flow for uh, Wednesday. Okay, see you then. <laughs>